for doing that. Look, today everything that we'll be talking about uh, is on this URL. So any references to publications or software or case studies is on this URL for you to download. I'll show it again at the end of the talk, so that means that you uh, won't need to uh, take prolific notes by all means, just uh, put your feet up, relax. Uh, there's a newspaper here if you get terribly bored with the talk, uh, just come on down. So I'll leave that up just for a second more. So today's talk. But what we decided was, because we deal in both higher education and the K-12 school space, that we've seen a bit of a disconnect. And it's a disconnect that um, is, it has been publicised and published, and, uh, and certainly it is it's quite public, uh, between the disconnect being between pre-service and, and in-service training in uh, communications and information technology. So we wanted to use our unique position working in both camps to uh, just share some, share some technology Technologies uh, with you. There's all sorts of political um, d directions happening, occur, of course, with the Rudd uh, government, so we wanted to get uh, stuck into those. Why bother? I guess uh, trying to predict where technology is going is impossible. The reality is that we tend to overestimate the impact of technology in the short term. You just have to look at the dot com crash to see that, but in the long term, we, we underestimate it. Now, even the very basic assumption that um, ICT or CIT, depending on which side of uh, the planet you're on, has a measurable effect on learning outcomes is, is a questionable one. Uh, Draper from Glasgow basically uh, argues the point that there's not a good deal of research out there to support that ICT uh, has a, a, a marked impact on teaching and learning. However, if you go out there and do a literature search, uh, I'm sure most of you, just an idea who's t who is is in the e-learning turf in the audience, just so I can... Right. Well, you would have, of course, not only contributed to the research out there, but just doing um, literature searches, there's a lot of um, research that supports the efficacy of ICT in teaching and learning. The Milken Family Foundation study is just one that's a, a good longitudinal study that does show the marked uh, impact of ICT. There has been, um, from the government, a good deal of comment on the fact that there needs to be a more coordination between pre-service and in-service training. And I guess one of the things we want to do today is talk to both educators. So is, who's here from the K-12 space, school space? A couple of folks, three folks, good. We want to make sure that the connections are there. They are, of course, in training anyway. Those in the university side have good relationships with the schools. But we just want to make sure that on a technological uh, level that we're on a, a level playing ground. Now, in our travels around the country, um, we certainly come across brilliant programs where content experts have brilliant ideas and it all falls down in a terrible heap because the, the content is only one part of the puzzle. Now I take this from chapter 13 of the Deering uh, Report on Lifelong Learning from 97 uh, from memory. Uh, chapter 13 looks at uh, technology and lifelong learning and Di Lorillard will be known to all of those who put their hands up as e-learning folks. And certainly our experience is if there isn't buy-in from the, these three sectors, ICT projects are going to crash and burn. It's just as relevant in schools. So if management doesn't have a clear IT strategy with training for staff and support infrastructure in place, forget it. All the grand ideas you have are going to crumble in a heap. If the guys from and, and ladies from ITS don't have network infrastructure that allows for, let's say, collaborative tools that we'll be talking about today, and boy, do we see this a lot. We walk into universities, we talk about using collaborative tools, video conferencing, doing groovy stuff, and the network guys have tied the, the network ports down and you can't actually get out of the university. And, and there you, there's the problem there. So there are cultural issues and there are certainly very very obvious barriers to, to look at. So a question we're going to ask uh, throughout this session, and we're going to move quickly, it's 90 minutes I know, but there's a lot of content, is why have teachers been so reluctant? And uh, that's something we're going to focus on throughout the talk. So in theory, there's a revolution uh, occurring at the moment, so the politicians tell us. Now hopefully in an academic environment you are healthily sceptical and uh, you question some of the moves there. But we've seen Rudd come to the party with uh, an emphasis on raising computer ratio to students uh, and so on. 
but not questioning how the computers are used. Now I'm from Brisbane and Queensland State Education Department a couple of years ago decided to get, for political reasons, sceptics could argue, uh, get the ratio of computers up there and the purchase of machines went for the system that was, get the numbers out there. Um, it couldn't do anything. The students couldn't actually burn DVDs. It didn't have a DVD burner. It ended up being used as a glorified typewriter and web browser. Um, the students couldn't create content. And if we're thinking about constructivist approaches to education, that's an issue. So healthy scepticism is a good thing, especially when you have the media reporting these sorts of stories. Outside political circles, there's been generally positive reaction to Labor's promise on the computer for every student in years 9 to 12. Kevin Rudd spelled out the deal in yesterday's policy launch, but one high school at Parramatta is already way ahead of him. Kevin Rudd wants to turn every high school digital. Arthur Philip High Parramatta should be the model. It's the state's second biggest school, 1,500 pupils. No chalk and talk here. It's had Wi-Fi for years. When we go to bottom school, we just like face the blackboards into the teacher. So of course it's kind of like boring. From year seven upwards, they learn Googling Shakespeare, writing blogs on one of the school's computers. Making podcasts and broadcasts, doing PowerPoint presentations, making our own movies. Yeah, it's all fun. When other schools are handing out books, Arthur Philip High is learning laptops. Hundreds at a time. Thank you. Students enter all their work on the web every lesson. When they go home, they can log on and complete homework. They can't come to school and power down. You've got to keep them powered up because they're certainly powered up in their home lives. Some parents rent computers for $2 a day, $60 a month. So a computer for every student, year 9 to year 12, seems like an impossible task. But here at Arthur Phillip High School, the view is Australia doesn't have a choice. Mark Burrows, National 9 News. So you'll hear Apple talk a lot about uh, what we call one-to-one -one programs, as we saw at Arthur Phillip, where every student has access to, to hardware. Not going to, to focus too much on that, but certainly that's a, a, a direction we've decided is an important one to empower students. A number of schools across the country are doing interesting stuff. Uh, over in Perth, we have uh, Orange Grove, which is a small school. We'll look at them in a moment and look at the way they're using their, their technology. I guess an underlying skill set that's really important, no matter what academic discipline you're involved in is creativity. I was very upset to hear yesterday at a, a presentation at Melbourne University, uh, Michelle Sill Sillinger from Cisco, uh, uh, a very interesting lady, spoke about some research that showed that employers in the US rated creativity very lowly. And I was, uh, I was upset about that, as would be some researchers in the field. Who has heard good old Sir Ken Robinson talk about creativity? No one? Well, that's good because you're going to. Um, look, creativity is a hard one to put your finger on. It's certainly, I th there are educational psychologists like Robert Epstein who have written uh, very prolifically in the area. I take this from a report Sir Ken, who was then Dean of Education at Warwick, uh, wrote about, which was imagination, originality, purposefulness and value. Now, some of these are very difficult to put a, a weighting on, value of, of, let's say, research outcome. How, how the heck do you give the value to a piece of art and creative arts is quite difficult. Uh, and an interesting anecdote, uh, Faraday, the chap who invented electricity, 1835, he was standing before the Royal Academy in London and he was showing them this funky thing called electricity. He had two metal spheres, sparks jumped to and fro and people were dazzled. The room, of course, was lit by gas. There, this was the first time we'd seen electricity. One of his uh, colleagues stood up at the end of it and said, uh, Faraday, that was very interesting, but what's it for? And Faraday replied, uh, what's a baby for? Now, you can work out what that means, but I think the use of that invention, how could you value it? There wasn't actually anything to use electricity at this stage. So in both research and in all areas, I think it's difficult, but certainly purposefulness, value, and so on. Now, Sir Ken is uh, on the lecture circuit now and talks about creativity not only to universities, but uh, to business. I'd like to show you a snippet of, of one of his talks. There'll be a URL to it on that website I gave you. Um, Sir Ken uh, has a couple of points there that I want you to think about. Number one is, what sort of roadblock are we putting in front of our students when it comes to creativity? That's the main message from Sir Ken. Now to speak, but do you know the bit where the three kings come in? 
Now they come in bearing gifts and they, they bring gold, frankincense, and myrrh. This has really happened. We're sitting there and they, I think, just went out of sequence. Because we talked a little while afterwards and said, you know, you're okay, let me. said, yeah, why was that wrong? They just switched, and that was it. Anyway, the three boys came in, little four year olds with tea towels on their heads, and they drew these boxes down. And the first boy said, I bring you gold. And the second boy said, I bring you mare. And the third boy said, Frank sent this. <laughs> 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 what these things have in common is that kids will take a chance. And if they don't know, they'll have a go. All right. They're not frightened of being wrong. Now, I don't mean to say that being wrong is the same thing as being creative. What we do know is, if you're not prepared to be wrong, you'll never come up with anything original. If you are not prepared to be wrong. And by the time they get to be adults, most kids have lost that capacity. Uh, they have become frightened of being wrong. And we run our companies this, by the way. We stigmatize mistakes. And we're now running national education systems where mistakes are the worst thing you can make. And the result is that we are educating people out of their creative capacities. Picasso once said this. He said that all children are born artists. The problem is to remain an artist as we grow up. I believe this passionately, that we don't grow into creativity, we grow out of it. Or rather, we get educated out of it. So why is this? Um, uh, I lived in Stratford-Aden uh, until about five years ago. In fact, we moved from Stratford to Los Angeles. So you can imagine what a seamless transition you know, was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, we lived in a place called Smithfield, uh, just outside of Stratford, which is where Shakespeare's father was born. Are you struck by a new thought? I was. You don't think of Shakespeare having a father, do you? <laughs> do you? But you don't think of Shakespeare being a child? Do you? Shakespeare being seven? I never thought of it. I mean, he was seven at some point. He was in somebody's English class, wasn't he? Do you think? How annoying would that be? <laughs> 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 Must try harder. He was sent to bed by his hat, to Shakespeare. Go to bed now, you know, to William Shakespeare. I put the pencil out. <laughs> and stop speaking there. <laughs> <laughs> it's confusing everybody. <laughs> So you'll find a link to that talk, seven, uh, 20 minute talk, it's a goodie. Um, and his book is out for about 45 uh, bucks at the moment, Out of Our Minds, have a read. Not an overly scholarly text as he is marketing himself to the business world as well. But some good points there, uh, I think. Uh, he was actually in Australia about four months ago and I only found out two days before my friends from QUT were reluctant to share the information broadly. Uh, but I did find out and turned up and his definition that he gave on that day of creativity, applied imagination, really works for me. I think it's hugely important. So just keep in the back of our minds creativity and not putting the barriers. His text, by the way, was great, is good and looks at how education's evolved out of the Industrial Revolution and how really it's a, it's a, a prolonged um, uh, university entrance uh, experience uh, is how we see schools in some cultures. Uh, interesting stuff uh, and you'll get to read about, a bit about Shakespeare as well. I was about to digress about on to Jermaine Greer's text on Shakespeare's wife, but I won't. Interesting book too. Um, Ever-changing curricula. The teacher has a moving target because of research from the universities, because of political uh, influences, and I guess New Zealand's a good one to focus on because they have a national curriculum, as, as you might expect. And just before Christmas, they announced the uh, new national curriculum that will be released in 2010. The feedback is so predictable. Now, some teachers uh, and educators believed um, that this is a great thing because the jobs that are out there don't exist yet uh, when the students... And we've all heard this, haven't we? They've come into school now, you will graduate in 20-whatever, 30, and the jobs that are there are jobs that may not exist. And that's, that's true. If you look at disciplines like bioinformatics, uh, web design and so on, they weren't around when we were at school. Uh, so it's all about skill sets that will allow them for change and adaptability and lifelong learning. The other predictable response, of course, was from the principal here of Wellington College, and he's worried about, I guess, uh, core values and the three R's. 
and that's quite understandable. Uh, it's up to you as the educators to tackle the, the, the issues here with, with curriculum and how it changes. I don't necessarily think that um, everything new is good. Um, I certainly am a strong believer in the power of face-to-face -face learning supplemented by technology or blended learning because technology of course can allow for authentic learning experiences and uh, I think there's a lot to be said for, for, for the model of course that's been out for eons with the Oxbridge chaps. In fact that text is an interesting read for those who want to get back into understanding the tutorial. The Oxford tutorial Thanks You Taught Me To Think is a nice one uh, edited by Blackwell uh, out of Oxford and there's a PDF of that book up on the website. So if you want to have a read uh, from folks like Richard Dawkins uh, and other scholars, it's a good one to have a look at. Now pedagogy of course can change because of ICT. There's a, a very strong shift one could argue from instructivist to an constructivist approach and I think importantly a use of multimodal information. Uh, I'm going to rely a bit on Jenny Way from Sydney Uni and uh, Colin Webb from UWS, the, a recent paper they did. The Australian Council of Deans, yes, about a decade ago, did focus on IT and, and how teachers should be using it. It was a pretty much a very minimalistic approach to ICT. This was pretty much the core of all they had to say, that IT is great for admin and to facilitate learning. They didn't actually delve any deeper into how technology can facilitate learning. Uh, for professional interaction, the word being collaboration. And we're going to focus today on some collaborative tools. We're going to look at things like wikis. So, Way and Webb tell us that only a minority of teachers use technology in a multimodal way. In fact, they have some wonderful, the paper is a PDF on that website. They define a teacher that they call higher order or proactive. So those who use technology in different ways, not just basically glorified typewriters and web browsers. They would be called the skills oriented teacher. Now, I don't know about you, but whenever I step foot in, in K-12 environments, the vast majority are skills oriented. Mm -hmm. When they talk about ICT, it's actually how to do, make PowerPoints. And we even saw a bit of that at Arthur Phillips High when the kid says we do PowerPoints, but then he also did, spoke about content creation, podcasting and so on. Webb and Way talk about a number of criteria that they see as indicative of a higher order teacher. And I'd like us to keep these in the back of our mind. Cultural exchanges online, collaboration. Global publication and crit critique, collaboration. Digital multimedia creation, this is higher order stuff, actually creating stuff. Collaboration beyond the school, not only within the school. You can see how the brick wall approach to technology, if they can't actually get out to the internet to collaborate, it's going to be a real issue. Open-ended outcomes and so on, this is not unknown to you. Now this is interesting and it's kind of stars in alignment because the Apple mantra that we've been saying for years, Chris File, your higher education guy here in Melbourne and Justin and I, when we get up every morning to do our yoga, we do our salute to the sun and our downward dog and so on, we have a mantra and that mantra <coughs> is create, distribute, Access and in fact, collaborate is the fourth one that I didn't fit on the slide. But typically, we do that in Pali or Sanskrit when we do our yoga. Uh, we won't show you today. So that's all very easy. But what are the reasons, possibly, that technology is not being used in the classroom? You can read the slide. Certainly, I know that eons ago, when I was in the classroom, I came out of college. Um, I was wanting to use technology. Back then, of course, it was only simulation software, you know, Mass Blaster and, and so on. But I, I walked into a school where the, that was a to total cultural misfit. The principal spoke of, in fact, I can still remember his words, there's not enough chalk and talk, Atherton. I can teach a kid to read off an old soup can label. And that's pretty much was his... Actually, in reality, he could. He was a gifted teacher. But technology, forget it. A total cultural mismatch. Uh, social obstacles there. Um, walking into some schools with uh, in socio-economic uh, challenging areas might be difficult to talk about one-to-one -one programs if government funding is not there. So there are all sorts of issues, of course. I asked Uni of Sydney for some thoughts. I don't think they're uh, reluctant to integrate SET. I think it's just a matter of um, the preparing and confidence. They're quite reluctant, but they don't perceive that they have the appropriate support or time. Teachers being highly 
enthusiastic about it and wanting to use it and, 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 and trying to use it, but not being, uh, in general, not being supported by the system as it were. It was a lot of work to you know, set up uh, an LCD projector and I could just use an overhead or a chalkboard instead. And while we accept in any hospital that the doctors, of course, do not fix the technical equipment, we do expect in schools that teachers fix uh, the equipment as well as be the expert in teaching and learning. Most teachers go to training and zero attention. We can be a bit of information overload. I think what needs to happen in teacher technology training programs is a more basic um, knowledge set for teachers to be able to adapt and learn how to use new forms of technology instead of learning how to use a particular piece of software that will be obsolete within a year. Uh, the right role for a teacher in an IT enriched classroom is not to be the technical geek or the technical expert. The right role for a teacher is probably more one uh, of, of somebody who uses IT to learn more about his or her students' learning. So um, teaching teachers to be critical, critical consumers of technology and media um, and how to adapt to new forms of technology is probably a better way to have them integrate technology into their classrooms. I think for that teachers will need to be better prepared to act as inquirers of their own practice, to act as researchers of their own practice. Teachers cannot innovate IT, uh, but what they can innovate is the practices they use in order to, to use IT in their classrooms, so they can be innovators of their practice. So it's really about creating a culture where, you can, where teachers are able to explore ICT and have the time to do that. And not a cultural issue. Uh, thanks to these guys, I just mentioned I was going to be doing a, a talk in this area and the passionate PhD students ran out and whipped up a video, so 